James Hemings was the first person to introduce mac and cheese to America. Hemings is also attributed to introducing other delicacies like creme brulee, meringue, whipped cream, and french fries. He was also the first American chef to undergo professional culinary training in France. And he did all of this while enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. So let's talk about it. If you'd like to hear more stories like this, you can hear stories like this at onemichistory.com. Also, support the channel. But without further ado, let's get started. Thomas Jefferson was a founding father in the United States, but he was also a plantation owner and over his lifetime owned over 600 enslaved individuals. At his peak, he owned 140 enslaved individuals at his Monticello estate, one of these being the Hemming family. The intricate relationship between the Hemings lineage and Thomas Jefferson is predominantly traced back to Jefferson's union with Martha Waylands. This marriage brought the Heming family into Jefferson's life, primarily as part of the estate that he inherited from Martha's father, John Waylands. The connection between Martha and the Hemings extends beyond mere ownership. They share a common parental lineage through Elizabeth Hemings, who was an enslaved woman who was enslaved by Waylands and bore several of his children. This shared ancestry ties Martha and Hemings together through bloodlines and bondage. Within this complex relationship, James Hemings and Sally Hemings stand out as central figures embodying the deeply intertwined destinies between the Hemings family and Thomas Jefferson. James Hemings was born in 1765. He was one of the children of John Waylands. This familial link thus made him Jefferson's brother-in-law when Martha was married to Jefferson. Despite the constraints of his enslaved status, Hemings was able to carve out a niche for himself within the hierarchical structure of the Monticello estate, particularly through his refinement and expertise of his culinary talents. His sister, though, Sally Hemings, is the more widely recognized due to her complex relationship with Thomas Jefferson. After Martha Jefferson's demise, there was a lot of conjecture concerning the intimate relationship between Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. These allegations suggested that Jefferson fathered several of Hemings' children and the emergence of DNA evidence in 1998 led credence to the assertion that Jefferson likely fathered at least one, if not all, of Sally Hemings' children. But that's a story for another day. James Hemings, though, from his youth, exhibited a proficiency for illiteracy, which was rare given the prevalence of anti-literacy statutes that prohibited the education of enslaved individuals. Thomas Jefferson recognized Hemings' potential and chose to cultivate it, driven not by benevolence, but by a desire to increase the value of his enslaved property. This investment exhibited an extraordinary culinary talents and remarkable use of his acquired skills despite the constraints of his bondage. Jefferson recognizing his talents when James was 19, he embarked on a significant journey from Boston to Paris with Thomas Jefferson and his sister Sally. Following Jefferson's appointment as America's trade minister in 1784, Jefferson facilitated his apprenticeship under esteemed chefs at the Chateau de la Chantilly, a culinary establishment that was unparalleled in its reputation during the 18th century. This apprenticeship was a privilege seldom afforded to even the local French population, providing Hemings with a comprehensive education in the intricacies of French cuisines, from pastry making to the art of soft preparation and the nuances of kitchen management. While in Paris, James was appointed as the chef of cuisine at Jefferson's private home, the Hotel de Jack, where he supervised a kitchen team, including white servants. This contrasted greatly with his life in America. Despite earning half of what the previous chef made, James managed to impress everyone with his skillful blending of French and American techniques, resulting in unique cuisine. He also used a part of his wages to hire a tutor and learn French. James and Sally would soon discover that a French law allowed slaves to seek freedom upon stepping on French soil. Still, they didn't take advantage of this law, possibly because they wanted to avoid being separated from their family back in the United States. 
1789, the Hemings siblings and Thomas Jefferson traveled from France back to America, specifically to Jefferson's Monticello estate. While in America, Hemings worked Jefferson's personal chef and received wages for his work. As the national government moved around in what would become the United States of America, so did Jefferson and Hemings. They lived in New York City for a time, with Hemings running the kitchen there and Philadelphia in 1791. Hemings put his culinary skills to use. Using the knowledge he gained in France, Hemings brought French culinary techniques to create uniquely American foods. It was during this time, while residing in Philadelphia, a state where slavery was abolished, that James initiated negotiations with Thomas Jefferson for his emancipation. Recognizing his culinary prowess, Jefferson consented to his manumission with a condition. He had to pass on his cooking expertise to another enslaved individual. Hemings handpicked his younger brother, Peter, for this role. This choice fulfilled two desires. First, he would finally be free. And secondly, it would help his brother, Peter, lead a better life under the circumstances. For two years, Hemings taught Peter everything he knew about cooking. So Peter could continue to make meals at the Jefferson estate. In 1796, when he was 31 years old, Jefferson finally signed his emancipation papers and Hemings had a chance to start a new life. So now a free man, Hemings faced the daunting task of making his own way in 18th century America. He left the Jefferson estate of Monticello and settled in cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore where he lived among other free blacks and worked as a professional chef. Despite his liberty and his press of culinary skills, his freedom did not shield him from the realities of 18th century America. Unfortunately, there are only a few records to shed light on his experiences after he was set free. But what we do know is that in a strange twist of fate, Hemings found himself once again in a dialogue with Thomas Jefferson. When Jefferson requested Hemings service for a second time, Hemings responded through Francis Sayers, another chef who he had worked with in New York and Philadelphia. Hemings indicated that he was willing to work with Jefferson, but felt uncomfortable about the prospect of working with unfamiliar servants. He asked Jefferson to write him directly, outlining the terms and conditions of the job offer. While Jefferson never wrote back, Hemings did briefly work at Monticello for about a month and a half in the kitchen, earning about $30 before moving on. The trajectory of James Hemings' life took a dark turn in 1801 when he died under very curious circumstances. It's widely believed that he committed suicide and the factors that would compel him to take his own life were completely speculative. It's postulated, though, that his personal adversities, possibly including being ostracized from his family and the challenges of navigating a prejudiced society, might have overwhelmed him in his final years. James Hemings had a profound effect on American cuisine, and one of his biggest achievements was just introducing foods like ice cream, mac and cheese, creme brulee, and french fries to America. He brought back many recipes from France and added his own spin using ingredients that he could find here in the States. For example, the classic mac and cheese is linked to a similar dish in France called macaroni pie. He then made his own version in America and it became popular when his brother Peter served it at a state dinner in 1802. Hemings also had a knack for making sweet treats. He used vanilla, sugar, cream, and an egg yolk to make fancy but extremely hard to make ice cream that was a big hit at Jefferson's parties. Another French dish that he brought back to American tables was French fries. Hemings tasted those in France, tweaked the recipe to make his own American version and added it to the menu in Monticello. Jefferson started promoting them and French fries became a popular dish all over the country beyond specific dishes. Hemings' broader influence lies in his role of blending French and culinary practices with American ingredients. This fusion approach laid the groundwork for what is now being celebrated as American cuisine, a melting pot of various techniques from other countries and traditions. Hemings proved that American dishes could possess the refinement and complexity of European cuisine while celebrating the local ingredients and taste. Hemings, who spoke both French and English, left behind important 
notes to help us learn more about his legacy beyond his cooking skills. These documents found at the Library of Congress include a list of kitchen tools, his own handwriting, and some recipes that he had created. They show us that Hemings was a very talented chef and offer us a glimpse into his fascinating life. Today, Hemings is finally getting the recognition that he deserves for his impact on American cuisine. His influence is being showcased at exhibits and at food events that honor his memory and celebrate his role in shaping early American cuisine. This new understanding goes beyond his knowledge and his cooking abilities, and it's a meaningful tribute to all the enslaved individuals like Hemings, whose contributions to American culture often go ignored and forgotten. Thank you. This has been One Mike. I'm your host, Country Boy. If you like stories like this, you can find more at onemikehistory.com. Thank you to all my subscribers and my contributors. I love you all. Without you, none of this would be possible. Peace.